Thank you. That was a beautiful rendition. I want to pray and then I want to start by telling you a story about a famous pilot. Let's pray. Father in heaven, once again, we ask that your spirit would fall afresh on us and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. She was at the height of her career and also at the height of her skill set. She was asked to be one of a few pilots called the Thunderbirds. Perhaps you've heard of them or maybe you've seen them fly, a part of the Air Force that not only demonstrates tremendous flying capabilities, but they also can be used for emergencies and need to be trained for military combat. So here she is, one of only, at the time, six women that have ever been asked in the 70-year history or so of the Thunderbirds. And she walks in her first day on the job. She says, my name is Nicole Malakowski. I'm the new pilot, and I'm ready to fly. And she was met with silence and stares. And finally, one of the higher ranking officers said to her, you don't get to touch our jets until we say you can. You don't get to fly until you know everyone on this team. You're to learn everybody's first name, last name, their spouse's name, their kids' names, where they live, their hobbies, and not only that, but we're going to put you in a mini internship so you can learn of all the different career functions that are on this team. And there are 25. The whole team consists of 125 people. And you need to learn every single piece and how it plays into this highly interdependent complex system. And when you do get a hold of it, you will have a better understanding of what role you play and how it can affect the team and how if someone is not performing to the highest standard, how that can affect you. And so we're all called to perform to the best of our abilities. And then we'll let you fly. And she learned a tremendous lesson that day. And as she went on with the program, this is the simple lesson. Nothing of significance is ever accomplished alone. Nothing of significance is ever accomplished alone. It takes everyone doing their very best for them to perform at the highest level. And that's exactly how it should be for the church as well. In fact, listen to how Paul describes how well we should be working together in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, please open to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll be reading through 20 and then a few other verses. And before we begin talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I want you all to see the importance of what a church member is. Because Paul goes on to describe what is a church member, how should church members be acting, what is not a church member, and how church members should not be acting. And he does through, through the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13 and 14. But before we start reading, I want to give you guys a little background on these books, which were actually letters to specific churches. And so that tells us that there's importance in church members and us working together here at the local level. And so, for example, the book of Romans was written to the church in Rome. The book of, or the letters to, of, of Galatians was written to the church in 
Galatia. Philippians was written to the church in Philippi. Thessalonians was written to the church in Thessalonica. Colossians was written to the church in... That's a little harder. That's a little harder to say. Colossae. Colossae. And so... Right there, Paul is already establishing that there's a work that the local church needs to do. And so he goes on to describe what that work is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want you guys to see something here. And some of these thoughts came from the book, I Am a Church Member by Tom Rayner. I want you to see something fascinating. In the book of Corinthians chapter 12, Paul describes... What is a church member? And we're going to be reading that. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is known as the love chapter, Paul describes what is the most important part about being a church member. We oftentimes use chapter 13 uh, for weddings and to talk about marriage and love, but the order of what Paul is actually trying to get across is church members' responsibility. What is a church member? What is the most important part about being a church member? And if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it describes how does a church member act in a worship service? Now, you'll know 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that it talks about women being silent in church. It's actually a reference to uh, the church in Corinth where men sat on one side and women sat on the other side. And Paul found out and he experienced that the ladies would often be talking and sometimes talking across the aisle, asking their husbands questions and disrupting the service. And so, yes, it was, there was a little bit of a culture challenge there that Paul had with women teaching, but in reference to women being silent in church, he's just describing how we should act in church. We should be listening. And it goes the same if you're a man or a woman, if you're a woman or a man. Men, we should be silent in church and we should be listening unless there's a part for us to play. So we're all on the same page there. So what is a church member? So Paul gets into this. He says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now let me ask you a question. If he's telling us that we're the body, who's the head? Christ, according to Colossians 1.18. He said that to the church in Colossae. Christ is the head, we are the body. Which is amazing to think that we're supposed to be so close with God and so connected to God that he is the head, and we're the body. And, he, and Paul goes on to say, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. The diversity that should exist in the body of God is wide. Is wide. We, we have different nationalities and cultures and skin color and, and, and languages. And, and this is the beauty that we could be so different, yet we come together under the same beliefs and truths to do God's work. Even though we have such diversity, and, and that's what heaven's going to be like, full of diversity. We want to celebrate that, that we have differences. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the, be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, 
yet one body. And so we see the diversity that God has in his churches as church members. And then he speaks of humility here, how we all need to understand the importance of working together, the, 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 the teaching fundamentally that we need each other. That we can't go at this alone. And I love the way Ellen White describes this in letter 122, 1902. Listen to how she says this when it comes to the body. She's, she goes on to say, in God's plan in a, in a diversity of gifts. In all the Lord's arrangements, there is nothing more beautiful than his plan of giving to men and women a diversity of gifts. The church is his garden, adorned with a variety of trees, plants, and flowers. He does not expect the hyssop to assume the proportions of the cedar, nor the olive to reach the height of the stately palm. Many have received but a limited religious and intellectual training, but God has a work for this class to do if they will. And I'm sorry that got cut out. Um, it finishes by saying um, that, let's see if I can find it here real quick. Here it is. For many have received but a, li a limited religious and intellectual training, but God has a work for this class to do if they will labor in humility, trusting in him. So Paul describes this as, how can the body say one is more important than the other? Can you imagine this for a moment? Imagine that the hand felt like it was more important and started complaining to the rest of the body, you know what? I'm the one that picks everything up. You guys don't have to pick anything up. It gets tiring picking up things and having to grab things and put this there and do that. Imagine if the ear said, oh yeah, you think you have a hard job? What about me? I have to listen to all the complaints and everything and the noise and I just want to hear peace and quiet some days and I can't even get that. What if the members were arguing back and forth. Wouldn't that seem so silly when they each have an important part to play? And so it is with the body of God. We each have an important part to play, and God wants us to play that part. We can't be arguing back and forth. We've got to be working together. That was God's plan, and he shared this through Paul here in the book of Corinthians. Now, when does the body rally together to try to help itself? Have you ever hit your finger with a hammer by accident? How many of you have done that? Okay, it seems like all of us have. What happens when you hit your finger with the hammer? The, the eyes see what just happened, right? Pain begins and what does your body do? Blood starts rushing to the area to try to give it some aid. Yes or no? And then what else happens? You start moving. Your legs can't stay still, maybe. And your mouth says, oh, oh. And what is happening with the members of your body? They're trying to rally around and trying to help where there is injury. And so should the same go for the church body. When one of us is down and needing something, we should all rally together to try to help those that are in need. And so Paul's making an emphasis here that this is what a church member is. This is what the body of Christ should look like. And not only that, but he goes on to say that we need to be living in community and we need to be together because here is what happens when we're isolated. Have you ever seen this picture? See, when we're together, it's very easy to help each other and confuse the enemy. But when we're isolated, that is one of the greatest strategies that the devil employs to try to get us to fall. 
He did it in the Garden of Eden, and he'll do it again, and he continues to do it on this earth. God says where two or more are gathered, there I will be there also. And so there's an emphasis that we can't go at this alone, that we need each other, that we can't be working together and be isolated because then we get ourselves into some trouble. And I love the way Hebrews points this out. Let's go back to the book of Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Let's take a look at Hebrews again, chapter 3, verses 12. 12 and 13, beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily, which is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And I want to point out something very important about what Paul is saying here, and I believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews is he uses the word exhort. And many of you know that that means to encourage. Um, The Greek word for exhort is actually called parakaleo. Parakaleo, it means to check up on, to implore, to appeal, to beg, to entreat. The tense is present, the voice is active, and the mood is imperative. God is saying it is imperative, it is a must for us to be in each other's business. But not for the sake of just being in each other's business, but to see how we can help each other get through these end times. It is imperative. So Paul says the Church member, uh, as a group, we're diverse. We need humility. We need empathy to get us through, and we need to stay together. Now, Ellen White, in letter 4, 1890, she says it this way, press together, press together. She says, love of self, pride, and self-sufficiency lie at the foundation of the greatest trials and discords that have ever existed in the religious world. Again and again, the angel has said to me, press together, press together, be of one mind, of one judgment. Christ is the leader, and you are brethren. You are brethren. Follow him. And so this is the importance. And so Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 12, and let's read the end of chapter 12. Now you are the body of Christ. I'm in verse 27. And the members individually. And God has appointed these. And then he goes on to say that there's apostles and there's prophets and teachers. And uh, uh, there are those that perform miracles and gifts of healing and administration and varieties of tongues. And he describes, again, apostles, prophets, teachers, uh, workers of miracles, but uh, healers. And, but then he says this in verse 31, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, Paul is saying it is important for us to be diverse and and humble and have empathy and work together. And then he goes on, but there's something else that's even more important as we consider what a church member is. He goes on to say, I will show you a more excellent way. And then we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which basically tells us that the glue to sticking together, to working together, to living in community is love. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding and all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it profits me nothing. Because love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, 
thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put all way, away my childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly. But when face to face, but then face to face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is, is love. Is love. So Paul is telling us here, when we look at 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, diversity, yes, important. Humility is a must. Empathy, got to have it. Love, there's nothing like it. We need that. And as we look to God, he will help us reach out and encourage us, but we've got to stay grounded in the Lord. Now, Ellen White goes on to say it this way in Evangelism, page 99. She says, the Lord desires his chosen servants to learn how to unite together in harmonious effort. It may seem to some that the contrast between their gifts and the gifts of a fellow laborer is too great to allow them to unite in harmonious effort. But when they remember that there are varied minds to be reached and that some will reject the truth as it is presented by one laborer only to open their hearts to God's truth as it is presented in a different manner by another laborer, they will hopefully endeavor to labor together in unity. Their talents, however diverse, may all be under the control of the same spirit. In every word and act, kindness and love will be revealed. And as each worker fills his appointed place faithfully, the prayer of Christ for the unity of his believers will be answered, and the world will know that these are his disciples. I love that writing. I love those, that quote by Ellen White. So I want to turn the corner and head to the finish line. I want you to think about this. You remember the story of Eve in the garden. She had wandered away from her husband. This is typical because we, even today, we sometimes meander away. We become isolated. We think we can handle it by ourselves. There are people that are struggling with all different types of challenges, and they think, okay, I'm going to just take care of this. I've got this. And here we are as a church body wanting to help, willing to help, available to help, and they stay isolated. And so here's Eve. She wanders away. She sees the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She starts to have a conversation with the serpent. And the serpent, once you get talking to the serpent, it's so easy to head down the wrong road. Once you start trying to understand and give in and, and argue, and, and she gives in. She grabs the fruit. And then her husband comes along and he gives it to the husband. And they start eating and sin now has entered the world and they realize it. And they realize that they're not the same people. And so what do they do? Instead of running to God, what do they do? They run from God because that's what sin does. It separates us from God. They, they go to hide. And we know that God comes looking for them. And he calls their name. 
Where are you? And what do they say? We were afraid. But why? And here, God finally explains to them what's going to happen as a result of their sin. And he also has an explanation for the, the, the serpent. And God puts this, or had a plan already in place. And it's to reverse everything that happened in the garden one day. And so, Adam and Eve took the fruit from the tree. Jesus allows himself to be placed on a tree for you and me to undo everything that had been done there in Genesis. His hands were pierced because mankind had stole from the tree using his and her hands. His feet were pierced because mankind, remember in Genesis 3.15, the first messianic prophecy where his heel would be bruised. Mankind grabbed the tree with its hands, grabbed the fruit, and walked away. And Jesus was offering himself on a tree. His hands would be pierced. His feet would be pierced. And remember that his side was even wounded. Why his side? Well, you remember that Adam was put to sleep and God took a rib out of Adam and made Eve from his side. You see what's going on? God is trying to respond to everything that they did by offering himself through all the mistakes that they made. Even the crown of thorns. Why the crown of thorns on his head? Will you remember the curse? Do you guys remember? The curse of creation was that the, uh, they would have to toil in the soil and that the ground would produce thorns of thistles. You remember that? And here Jesus is taking on the curse to restore us back to God. And he dies on the cross for us. And he just wants us to remember that he loves us. He is the head and we are the body. And when we listen to his voice, and the body acts according to the will of God, his mind. And when we encourage each other as the body and stay together, as Ellen White said, pressing together and working together and living in community, that is God's ideal for us as church members and for the body of Christ. What do you say, dear church? Are you willing to accept this and truly be the body of Christ, live in community, check up on each other, help each other, because God's coming soon, and he's coming for a people that hear his voice and do his will. What do you say, dear church? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for your love and care for this church. And we as members of this church want to respond to you. Be with us this week as we seek to draw closer to you and to each other. Help us to heed these words of Paul, these stories, Lord, that remind us of your goodness and love and mercy. And Lord, help us to put away sin and the challenges that we have and, and to trust in you that you're able to help us to get through. And Lord, I just want to lift up every person that's here and those that are listening, watching online. Lord, be with us. Help this week to be different where we, where we respond to you more and more because of your great love. And I ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for listening.